to continue our conversation. Give everyone just a second to settle down. Thank you so much for joining us. I am thrilled to continue this very important conversation on DEI and racial justice and equity with someone who has been a singular leading voice on this topic in our industry. Please join me in welcoming the Pulitzer Prize winning journalist and creator of the 1619 Project, Nicole Hannah-Jones, to the stage. Nicole literally got into Philly like an hour ago, so yes, we need the warm welcome for her. Thank you so much for Thank coming you. to ONA. Thank you. I like the little, little walk-on music. That was awesome. <laughs> I would have maybe chosen a different track, but we'll go with it. That's all right. We'll get it for the, for the outgoing walk. Uh, you heard a little bit of our conversation um, as, you, as you just came in. So we're talking about the status of DEI in journalism, promises that were made in 2020, where we are now, a, a lack of pro We've seen some progress. We would like to see a lot more. But just to sort of set the stage for the audience, what is your perspective on where we are in the industry right now when it comes to racial equity and justice? Um, first of all, hey, everyone. Um, where's Lashara? Just want to congratulate my Bula Shara. <laughs> um, so, as you know, um, 2020 was allegedly a year of racial reckoning. I feel like I don't have to tell anyone in this room how fleeting that was and how many of us who cover issues of race, race and injustice or who just, you know, have any understanding of America um, knew that it was going to be fleeting. And we didn't clearly see a lot of pro progress. Uh, we saw, um, I think, for a while, coverage was really altered. We were seeing a lot of attention being paid, not just to the racist of the week, but actually trying to report on structural racism, on entrenched racism. And then we saw, of course, a larger uh, backlash to the reckoning. And we experienced that in our newsrooms as well. So I think that there was a, a sense in many newsrooms that there was an overcorrection, mm -hmm. that maybe the coverage had gone too far one way, and now we needed to come back. And I think part of that was a sense that um, externally, that um, people were thinking that newsrooms were, were, were going too far to the left. But I also think internally, amongst a lot of our colleagues, there was a sense that we had, were paying too much attention to racial justice and a discomfort uh, with how far that had gone. Um, and so we've seen really the coverage. So one, we haven't, we haven't made a lot of progress on diversifying newsrooms. Um, and certainly, I think the coverage has gone in an almost completely different direction where we started really paying. I think we should, of course, report on um, the, the more conservative viewpoint, but we began to center that as being more problematic than the actual racial injustice, right? That um, students who would be protesting a certain speaker on campus were being given the same weight in news coverage as the state, right? Of, of governors, of legislatures, of school boards actually using the powers of government and the state um, to censor. So I, I think many of us are feeling that every time there's a racial progress, there's also racist progress. And it's not saying whether people are being intentionally racist or not, but just a, an overall discomfort with trying to enact real change. Yeah. Yeah. Now, there's been a lot of backlash to the 1619 Project, right? And we've seen, <laughs> I don't know if you've heard, um, I don't know if you watch Fox News ever. Uh, I wouldn't, but- Only when I'm sitting next to someone on Delta who's watching Fox News. That's always a fun time. There, we've also seen this um, against DEI in general, right? The, the buzzwords against critical race theory, the idea of even trying to name white supremacy in our systems and our institutions. Has anything about this backlash in the last few years surprised you? You mean the backlash to the 1619 Project in general or just the overall backlash? To the 1619 Project in general. Yeah, I mean, I, yes. I think 
most of um, both the duration of the backlash and the extremity of it has been surprising to me. I, I knew that there would be backlash to the project. And, and in some ways, if there hadn't been, I wouldn't have found the project successful, right? The project was intentionally being evocative. We were trying to make an argument about America that um, hadn't been mainstreamed enough for, for my taste. So I expected that. But of course, um, you could not have predicted that the 1619 Project would be the target of federal legislation, trying to ban it from the classroom, state legislation banning it from the classroom. Um, it was mentioned in both of Donald Trump's impeachment trials, which is just insane to me. Um, it was used in, um, of course, it was deployed against the uh, first black woman Supreme Court justice in her confirmation hearing. And it really is um, the, the seed that led to the larger anti-critical race theory um, propaganda campaign. So all of these bills, these anti-critical race theory bills began with anti-1619 project bills, and then they expanded out. Um, so in all of these bills, if there is a single text men mentioned, a text mentioned, it is only the 1619 project that's actually being banned um, legislatively. And so no, I, I, I couldn't have predicted any of that, and I couldn't have predicted how the 1619 Project and this, again, propaganda terminology uh, in the way that they're using uh, critical race theory would become kind of central um, to the political campaign. Now, could I predict that race would be used as a wedge issue? Of course, yeah. race is the oldest wedge issue in America, but um, that, you know, something is to me, benign as a single newspaper project that it could become kind of central to these campaigns has been very startling. Um, but also what's been really disappointing is, is how media has covered what has happened. Um, I think that me media has really failed to grasp the danger of these anti-critical race theory legislation, to cover them in an appropriate way that this is uh, state-sponsored censorship, that um, you cannot equate people protesting something to the state prohibiting ideas and speech that it doesn't like. And because we've covered it that way, we've sort of legitimized what's happening. I mean, to me, the fact that Ron DeSantis is considered a legitimate Republican contender for uh, the presidency, when you look at the, the policies, which if you read a book called How Democracy Dies, he meets the checklist, right, of uh, like proto-fascism, like the, the policies that he's enacting, and yet we as journalists really don't know, again, how to cover someone who is um, openly enacting authoritarian policies um, we haven't learned from Donald Trump, and we haven't learned how to cover someone who is, has a more respectable veneer than Donald Trump. So that's really what worries me most is, is our continuing failures as journalists to grapple with how to cover what we're seeing in our politics. I think even some of the language that you're using is so important, right? And that's something that I'd hope becomes more mainstream in newsrooms, propaganda campaigns, state-sponsored censorship. There are all sorts of euphemisms or more softer language that a lot of news organizations are using as they're covering these issues. It, go, it feeds into this idea of um, false objectivity, right? False equivalencies when we're talking about the two political parties or the two ideological sides. How did you come to be so aware of how important that nuanced language is? And you know, what is your advice to up and coming journalists who need to learn these same lessons? So it's, it's a fascinating question. Um, I mean, one, I think, and why I think it's fascinating is of course as journalists, we understand by profession, by trade, the power of words, right? Like that's literally what we do is we understand that words have power and words can uh, change how we think about any given issue based on what terminology we use. And yet somehow when it comes to covering what's happening in our own country, we no longer know how to use direct terminology. We no longer know how to use the dictionary definition of what is happening. So it's always interesting to look at how we cover similar things um, in other countries. Like how did we cover what was happening in Brazil versus what was happening in the United States? And how are we so able to, with clarity, call out when we're seeing these things um, in other countries? 
but don't want to use the language here. Like how many times have we seen euphemisms for racism, yeah. racially tinged? I, tinge is, what does that mean? What does it mean? It means nothing, really. It means nothing, right? And yet what it speaks to is the discomfort of the journalist, and that's not objective. So we have a profession that's at once telling us we have to be objective, but you can't call Trump a liar because that might make us look biased. Well, actually, I think not telling the truth makes us look biased. Um, and that, you know, you cannot, you know, pretend to have balance in an unbalanced system. It doesn't mean, of course, that journalism does not have to uh, hold the other political party Democrats accountable, but we cannot pretend that they are doing the same things, right? And so we can't say, well, we wrote a story that reflects negatively on Republicans, so now we have to write one that reflects negatively on Democrats. When there's one political party that clearly is eschewing all democratic norms where you have people who are saying, we don't actually believe in democracy, we don't think all citizens should vote. You have to cover it in that way. And I think we're very um, self-conscious to, to a degree that we don't inform the public um, because of that. So I've been, you know, that's one of the reasons why I founded the Center for Journalism and Democracy at Howard University, because I really felt that in this time where the press is the firewall of our democracy, where the press has to be part of that system of checks and balances that we believe ourselves to be, that we were too often failing in that duty. And that instead of um, reporting about truth, we were reporting about power and we're reflecting power and not truth and we're reflecting our own fear that we'll be called biased and by doing so creating a very biased report that wasn't informing the public so I think um, you know I come up I, I've always worked in quote-unquote mainstream media but I get my my journalistic viewpoint from the black press right a, a press that um, doesn't pretend that journalism is an advocacy a press that could not pretend that you're reporting on a country that's on your side, right? That can't pretend that our systems will hold, that, um, that we can ensure that our rights will be protected because they have always been. Like I, I come from a tradition where, you know, it's amazing that by nature, we are supposed to be a skeptical profession. And if, if y'all went to journalism schools similar to mine, one of the first things you learn, you know, in journalism reporting 101 is if your mother says she loves you, check it out, right? We all, we all heard this. Um, and yet too often, we're not reporting with that skepticism when it comes to power. And we're not internalizing that skepticism when we look at our own report. So that to me is like, I, I understand that language can either reveal or obscure. And too often, we're using language that obscures, language that softens what's happening to us uh, uh, in our country. And then that means that people, the public, cannot be informed enough to know uh, we are in a dangerous period. And our institutions may not hold. There are places where they're not holding. Um, the attacks on not just the 1619 Project and what they're calling critical race theory, but on black studies, right? The, this is all about delegitimizing certain people and certain voters to clear the way um, for anti-democratic policies. And I really think I would invite you all, we're having our second annual uh, democracy summit at Howard on November 14th. It is a summit where we bring experts who can tell us what we're seeing and explain to us from um, political science viewpoint, but also a historical context with the data, uh, it is geared towards journalists because I just think too many of us haven't studied enough history. We are not contextualizing what we're seeing. And if, if our political reporters, um, the demographics are often not reflective of the country, not reflective of the people who are most marginalized. And so I think they really do think in the end, our systems were hold. If you come from the black perspective, you know that that is not the case. And you cover what's happening very differently. But we all as journalists have the ability to cover what we're seeing without that having to be your personal experience. But you have to actually do the research. In so many organizations, why do you think that fear of appearing biased seems to be more acute than a fear of appearing inaccurate? 
it's what you were saying, like you have, to, you have to call a spade a spade, right? As journalists, that's our job. And yet the bias fear seems to overpower the idea that we should just be accurate to what's going on in reality. You know, it's an interesting question um, because it seems that we are much, much more beholden to what conservatives think about us than what people who consider themselves progressive. And I think it's because we get the label as a profession. I think we like to think of ourselves as a profession as being more progressive, right? And so because we think we are progressive, which I don't actually think that's true. Exactly. <laughs> I look at the coverage every day and I'm like, that's, it's not progressive. Um, but we think that we are. And because we think that we are, then we are especially uh, worried when people on the right say we're being unfair. Because of course, most of our newsrooms still do believe in this idea of objectivity. Um, I think you know, we come out of a generation where um, this notion of balance is very important. It took a long time. Think about even something like climate change. For a very long time, there was a sense that if you, if you talk about climate change, you have to give climate deniers equal, you know, equal play in a news article so that you appear to be fair. But to me, what is more important is accuracy, right? Is it accurate? Is client uh, climate denialism true? Or is this just what a small number of people say? So you don't give them balance in the story or you're not actually painting an accurate picture. I don't believe our job is to be stenographers, right? I didn't get into journalism just to say this person said this and this person said that. I got into journalism to inform and to inform you have to get to the truth of it as best as you can. Um, and too many of us are so worried that someone will accuse us of being biased against the right um, that our coverage actually then veers away from truth. And um, I think the idea, you know, when you're a journalist of color or you come from a marginalized group, people presume to know your bias, right? They literally think you wear your bias on your skin. And yes, I am biased, right? I'm a human being. Um, but the white male journalist or the white upper class journalist actually thinks they are neutral. That they're the default yes. point of view, right? That they're not biased, that their perspective is neutral. And they're not, right? They are also growing up in a racialized society. Um, their class, uh, their gender are all affecting how they see coverage, but we only call it out when, when we think that you are not the norm. Um, and what that leads to, to me, is coverage that too often fails, that too often is not reflective of the realities of people on the ground. I mean, look in a city like Philadelphia. Look at the daily newspaper, right? Look at the makeup of the newsroom and look at the makeup at the city. Then look on your front page, and this is, I'm saying Philadelphia because I'm in Philadelphia, but Detroit, New York, Los Angeles, and look on the front page and say, does that reflect the community or does that reflect power? And every day we see a reflection of power, but not what's actually happening and, um, for most of the citizens. And that is a choice and that is a bias. Now you mentioned Ron DeSantis. We, in our previous conversation, we were talking about the movements at the state level um, for more of these bans, the idea that book bans are you know, increasingly common. What do you think newsrooms should be focusing on in terms of coverage? Like what are, what are the stories or focus areas that you wanna see more of? So one, um, if you all saw uh, an investigative piece that Nicole Carr at ProPublica did a few weeks ago, to me this exemplified both the failures in the profession and what we can do when we're actually trying to report accurately on what's happening. So if you haven't seen it, she did this amazing piece on the Moms of uh, Liberty. where So we all know this is a racialized movement, clearly, right? This is a white woman's movement. And yet, so many journalists were afraid to call it that. Like, we can see it. And so writing about Moms for Liberty and not pointing out that it is a white woman's, really white nationalist movement, to me means you are not reporting the truth. So what Nicole Carr did is she looked at the coverage. She was being frustrated by the coverage. But this is where we as journalists have power, right? We have some of the greatest power in our country in that we see something that's not being covered correctly, the, the public is not being informed, and we have the ability to provide that coverage. So she did, um, she got all, every video that she could find of, of Moms for Liberty coming to a school board meeting or any other type of meeting, and then she just created a database. What was the race of the speakers? What was the gender of the speakers? What did they talk about? Who, what was the race of the supporters? And she was able to then write with authority that this was a white woman's 
white nationalist movement, she was able to cite the thing that we're all seeing that journalists were afraid to do. This is the type of coverage that we need to be seeing. How many stories have we seen on what it's like to be a black parent in Florida right now? How many, how many stories have we seen about what it's like to be a black child in a school district where the books about your people are being taken off the shelves? Or frankly, to just be a child in a school district when you come in and see the library has been cordoned off. Um, where's the story that's connecting the history of Florida? Like we think of Florida as Miami. Florida is a deep South state. If you look at the history of Florida, Florida had some of the worst racial terrorism, racist terrorism in the history of our country. But we're not covering what we're seeing there in that way. We're not covering why the black community is so vulnerable, black communities in Florida. So I just think we need to have a lot more depth in the coverage and not allowing ourselves, because we're uncomfortable writing about racialized movements in a racialized way, to not then cover these movements accurately. Yeah. Um, I also just think, again, when we're talking about language, what Ron DeSantis is doing is authoritarian. Now, I don't think we should just throw out words. You'll never see really in anything I've ever written, I don't call anything white supremacist, unless it's in a historical document, because I actually don't think that term is that useful. And I think when people see white supremacists, they automatically are turned off. So just say what we're seeing, right? Be specific and call out what we're seeing, but we, we're using race neutral language in a time, even Ron DeSantis, what he's doing, right, when he's targeting voters, when he's gerrymandering out black electoral districts, he is speaking to a racial demographic that we are not reporting on explicitly because we think the only way we can call out something is racist is you have to say the N-word. And then if you say the N-word and you apologize, then we'll still say, well, maybe it wasn't racist. Maybe he didn't really mean to do that. You have to have dexterity with how race works in America to cover what's happening in our politics right now. And too many of us do not. Study history. You have to. I, I, I don't think, you know, I, I remember right after January 6th and on every news channel I was watching, you had pundits who were saying, we've never seen anything like this in the history of our country. That, this is exactly why we see the attempts to erase the teaching of an accurate history of America, right? The teaching of black history is inherently political because if you teach the history of black people in this country, you're automatically dispelling the myth of America. We're very inconvenient to the you know, story of American greatness. So when you have people who are saying nothing like this has ever happened, I know you don't actually know anything about history in America. And frankly, you have abdicated your role as a journalist when you do that. There's, of course, Wilmington, which was an actual coup, but there's also an entire period of reconstruction where democratically elected governments, biracial governments, governments that are reflected of, reflective of the Democratic Party today were overturned, where people challenged elections, where they overthrew elections, um, where they discarded votes. Everything that we're seeing now has happened before. And yet journalists are covering it from a perspective that all of this is new. And when you don't understand that, um, that this is very old, then you don't understand that actually what we're seeing now is where our politics have always been inclined to go, right? Even thinking we're the oldest democracy in the world, if black people aren't part of democracy, then yes, that's true. But if black people are part of democracy, then we don't get democracy until 1965, and it's always been contested. So understanding that history, that, it's, that multiracial democracy has always been contested, then you cover what you're seeing in America very differently. And then you inform the electorate um, in a way that's actually useful for them politically, as opposed to the reactive and reactionary way that we tend to cover politics. The local aspect of it that you're mentioning is so important. I'm from Louisiana, born and raised. Um, if, I don't know how many people here know about the Colfax massacre, but it was the biggest, deadliest massacre of the Reconstruction era. It happened in central Louisiana. Again, born and raised, grew up there. Never heard about this until I was out of college. Um, I actually learned about it from um, you know, somebody who wasn't even from Louisiana. And finally, we're at the, the stage where they did put up a memorial last year um, in Colfax, and I was able to visit it, and, and they're starting to teach, actually, the local populations about what actually happened and, and the history of this. Um, but what have you seen in terms of 
trying to expand people's understanding of what American history actually is. Yeah, and, and so I'm, I'm going to answer that, but I, I think that's such a great example because, again, I mean, I'm a history nerd, obviously, right? So I'm not saying everybody has to be as nerdy as me, but um, having some basis of understanding, why does that historical context matter? So when we see um, the gerrymandering that's occurring today or we see um, so-called race-neutral policies that make it harder uh, for black and brown people to vote, um, and then we say, well, they don't mention race, so how can this be a policy designed against certain races. Well, if you study history, then you know when the fifth, after the 15th Amendment, you could no longer explicitly target voters by race. The grandfather clauses were race neutral, okay? Grandfather clause does not say black people can't vote. It says you can't vote if your grandfather didn't vote. And since 95% of black people were enslaved, their grandfathers were enslaved, that means black people can't vote. Literacy tests, race neutral, right? Um, Tests that say you have to recite the Constitution, race neutral. But they were all designed to be race specific and to have race specific impact even though they were race neutral. So if you don't know that history, if we are stripped from that historical context, this is really why you know, all of these uh, anti-history laws are memory laws. Read Timothy Snyder if you haven't. They're not, everything that happened in the past happened. But what you know and remember about what happened in the past then shapes your understanding of the society that you live in. Journalists have to have a basis of that understanding um, if they are going to help us to know why our society is responding in the way that it is. You can actually predict a lot of what we're seeing if you have that historical context, which I don't think answered your question, but just read history. <laughs> just read history, it's good advice, it's good advice. To that end, were you surprised by January 6th when it happened? Yes, I mean, I think you can, yes. I don't think anyone would be honest to say they really expected a coup on the Capitol. Um, so I was surprised by it, but one can be surprised and not shocked. Yes. So, yes, I was surprised that in that year um, you would see that happening, but knowing history and, again, understanding that we have a, a, a deep-seated anti-democratic thread that has always existed in our country and that even our founders, they didn't intend a multiracial democracy. They didn't intend that people who are not white men would determine who leads our country and that we've never been a country that actually wanted that. So again, in the book, How Democracies Die, I recommend that you get it, it's very short. Um, they talk about how until 1965, we didn't have a democracy in the United States, we had an ethnocracy. I'd never had the term for what we actually had in this country, but it was a democracy for one ethnic group. Mm -hmm. And that everything that we're seeing um, is a society, a majority society, um, I think a minority of the majority society that did not ever believe that we should be a country where people of color decide elections. And we are seeing the response to that. So what happens with Obama in 2008? You are able to elect a black man with a minority of the white vote. So of course after Obama, white people be like racism is over, we elected Obama, but actually y'all did not elect Obama. <laughs> Most white Americans voted against Obama. But you could have a, a minority of the white vote and heavy majorities of every other person who is not white and take, send a black man to the White House. This shifts something in our society, right? This shifts something in, uh, amongst a um, significant proportion of the white electorate who feels they are losing power, where they had the exclusive control over who got elected, and those people would always be white, and now you have a increasingly diverse country where we as journalists are always saying we're going to be majority minority. Please, if you take one thing, no, don't, don't let this be the only thing you take away from my talk, but one of the things. Don't use that phrase. Don't use that, like, we're journalists. We, are, we, we should use accurate and specific language. Majority and minority are numeric terms. Either you are more than half or you're less than half. So every time we use majority minority, what we're saying is that minority is a status. It is an inferior status in society, and one day we will be ruled by our inferiors. That is what using language majority minority means. What we will, thank you, it's just, 
we have to think about, right? It's dangerous. It's the, 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 the lexicon is dangerous. What we will have is a plurality, which is not a bad thing in a multiracial democracy, where white Americans still hold the power and are still the largest ethnic racial group in our society. That is the truth. So every time we use those terms, so you have a multiracial minority white electorate that elects a black man um, to the highest office in the land. And then you have the constant drumbeat from media saying in 50 years, white people are gonna lose the majority and they're gonna be, we're gonna be a minority majority country. And that creates a great deal of fear and hostility that we are now seeing and paying the consequences for. So we have to take ownership on the role that we as media play when we use that language, when we don't tell the truth, um, when we're not accurate, and we, when we ourselves are uncomfortable with the society that we have. So when you ask about DEI, I think the lack of progress speaks to the, the discomfort of people who run newsrooms, of actually not wanting to see the newsroom change, not actually wanting to see the coverage change, right? If you've been in this profession long enough, Lord, sometimes it's hard to admit how long I've been in the profession because then I have to admit I'm old as hell. Um, but I've seen every, you know, I've seen us go through periods where we have all kinds of race beats and then all those beats go away. And then something crazy happens in America having to do with race, George Floyd, and then all of a sudden everybody wants to create a race beat again. But don't actually try to cover race the way that it needs to be covered, which is not this person said something racist, this person said something racist, but in a way that critiques structures and power, then that's gonna be a problem. And then it's a fad, and then we get rid of it. If you cover a beat in America, you should be covering race. There is nothing that you can cover. Now this was how I became a successful race writer because I'm like, I don't give a damn. You could put me on education, cops, county government, environment, whatever you put me on, I, can, I will write about race because it's everywhere. But too many of us are abdicating our responsibility to have an understanding of how race works in our society no matter what your beat is. I am not a great writer about these issues because I was born black in America. That certainly helps me in how I see stories but it's because I study this as an area of expertise. I read the history, the sociology, I study the data, right? The same way you wouldn't be a science reporter and not study the literature of science and get expertise in science, how can you cover these issues when you have no knowledge outside of you walk around in the skin that you're in? Um, so we all need to be doing that. We all need to be trying to get a better understanding to contextualize for ourselves and then to contextualize for our public um, what it is that we're seeing and really the truly dangerous moment. Like uh, there's people right now who think, you know, Trump got indicted, he got arrested, that our systems are working. Well, I would tell you as a black person who studies history, I won't believe our systems are working until they've actually worked. And we don't know what is going to come out of this, but. Clearly that man can get elected again. Uh, clearly uh, our systems can start to work and still erode. And so let's have that natural skepticism that we are supposed to inherently have as journalists um, where too often I think we believe uh, in the mythology of America and so we cover our country in that way. At the Republican debate on Wednesday night, the majority of candidates there said they, they raised their hands that they would still support Donald Trump as a nominee even if he's convicted. Exactly. I wanted to ask you about that um, briefly because I know you've said that Donald Trump attacking the 1619 Project, like you can't imagine a bigger badge of honor. Uh, where were you last night when he was being booked and you saw the mugshot come out? I was actually not paying attention to that shit at all. <laughs> <laughs> I really, I, I, I really, I, I didn't. You know, it's like, um, I was like, I'll get the highlights later. Um, because I, I do, I don't know what it means. And I don't try to predict the future. I, I, I've learned enough to know we can't predict what is going to happen or not. And um, there is something, I mean, I tweeted about this. There is something divine about black women, right, being the ones who have the courage um, and the rigor to bring these cases forth when our Justice Department was unwilling to do it, when our political system was unwilling to do it, that black women truly are the saviors of democracy. 
Once again. Once again. Um, it would be nice if democracy once in a while had our back in return, but you know, we're gonna do what we came to do. Um, so there's something, there's just, I, I mean, as much as you critique America, there is something amazing that that moment could happen in that way in Atlanta, right, in the Deep South, in a city where black people have, um, have gained power um, and have played the role that black people have always played, which is to be on the very bottom of society, to be written out of democracy and yet fervently believe in the potential of it and being willing to risk everything, right? This woman is getting death threats. There's no reason to believe she would necessarily succeed in this country. She's in a state where they've already passed a bill through the legislature that would make it easier for her to be removed from office as we saw DeSantis remove a duly elected black woman from office in Florida, and yet is willing to risk all of that for democracy. So again, think how we cover these things. Are we seeing that story being written? Are we seeing that story shaping our perception of what's happening right now? So I, I, I wasn't watching it, um, but I just enjoyed seeing all the memes. <laughs> <laughs> all the memes, the recaps, um, because I, I, I actually find, for me personally, I'm not a political reporter, so I don't have to be glued to every you know, inch of what's happening, um, that it's more healthy for me not to watch this all the time and try to to step back and see what's what's the larger story um, at play. And to your point about what stories are we seeing, I've seen some of this, but I would like to see more. The black women who are also just the everyday poll workers that are being intimidated um, by the sitting president at the time uh, and the death threats that they are now facing because they were just trying to do their job and do it right. Um, I know we, we, we need to wrap up soon. I feel like I could talk to you forever, and I know that this audience would be here forever for that too. But we've got this wonderful room full of newsroom leaders, managers, journalists, editors, reporters. What do you want them to take back to their newsrooms? I hate when I have to come up with something inspirational at the end. <laughs> it doesn't have to be oh, inspirational. Okay. <laughs> Good, because I'm not, I'm not inspirational. I, I, don't, I don't seek to inspire. I, dis I mostly disagree, just to okay. shame. I like to shame. Um, but, <laughs> you know, but, but actually, uh, I, I'm, gonna, I, I'm feeling a little out of sorts, which means I feel a little bit inspirational. So I'm going to leave with something. Um, I actually think, I, I really do, that we are some of the luckiest people um, in this country um, to work in this profession. As much as we get down on it, as much as you know, our colleagues are, are often struggling to make ends meet or even keep their jobs, as much as we complain about our failures, um, we have the power to see things in our society that aren't right and do something, right? And, and that's something, you know, even when the affirmative action ruling came out and, and seeing predictably that with this court, Edward Blum was not just going to target what is happening um, at the collegiate level, but that he was going to go after really any programs that are designed to benefit descendants of slavery. Um, I can feel really down about that, and then I can say, I'm gonna write something to expose what I really think is happening and to force people to have to think differently about this and to try to give us a roadmap um, of where we can go. Um, that's, a, that's an amazing power to have. And I, I imagine everyone in this room, at least I hope, takes that power very seriously and that it's okay to, to be down, but don't cede that power. So go back to your newsrooms. Um, and cover what needs to be covered, and do the work that needs to be done, and understanding that you may not see. I mean, I write about the most entrenched shit in America. Like, I was, I'm the, like probably the only investigative reporter who's like, no matter what I write, no shit's going to ever change, <laughs> which is not typically why you get into investigative reporting, right? You're, you're expecting some head to roll. No head will ever roll when I'm writing about segregation in housing, segregation in schools. Um, but I write because I need to create the record. I need to try to create the tension that can lead to that societal change. Um, and so just go back, talk shit, because that's what reporters do. We are a complaining bunch, and it's our right. So complain, and then you know, go out there and do the work that needs to be done. This, this is a time where if you didn't know how important our work was to the very democratic fiber of our country, I think that is very clear. And it's not just the national reporters. 
most of what is hurting people, most of what affects people is happening at the local level. And that reporting is so critical right now. So just go out there and fucking kick ass and do what we got in this profession to do, no matter what. Because every day, I never have to wake up in the morning and say, I don't want to do my job. Um, every day I'm just excited uh, that I have the privilege of doing the work that I do, and I hope you all do as well. Thank you so much. I think that is a brilliant note to end on. You say you're not inspirational, but that was very inspirational. Uh, I'll do one, one quick last question because I'm just, um, I, I love hearing and watching you speak about this. When you're constantly being attacked, how do you keep your focus and your confidence and your belief in the importance of your work? Um, well, my, my, Aaron, are you still over there? Aaron will know I didn't always keep my focus. And actually, if any of you follow me on Twitter, you knew there were some days you were like, this heifer needs to put that phone down. <laughs> but, you know, what I'll say is um, I understand where the attacks are coming from. If the work was insignificant, if the work didn't matter, if they didn't worry um, that a public that is more informed about um, why we have the inequality that we have would choose different policies. You don't spend your time attacking things that don't matter, right? You don't try to discredit work that is insignificant. So um, the focus for me is easy. You know, my name is Ida, Ida Bay Wells on Twitter, of course, paying homage to Ida B. Wells. I've been rereading, um, I just finished rereading her autobiography and I've been rereading her work, you know, The Red Record. And I'm like, if this woman, living at the time that she lived in, could be fearless. It's easy. What I do every day is easy. I work at the New York Times. I have the biggest megaphone in the world. I have protection if I need it. Um, so I, I don't require motivation. I, again, I really do just feel tremendously blessed. And I'm an Aries, so I love conflict. <laughs> <laughs> I love, I love, like, Come at me, boo. I have time, though I'm doing better. I'm doing better. I try to at least, I try to at least not argue with people who have less than five Twitter followers. <laughs> um, <laughs> good, good rule of thumb, right? Yeah, don't do that. Um, and it's actually been very healthy for me to stop engaging um, on social in that way. But again, like we just have, it's just amazing what we get paid to do every day. Um, and so it's. Uh, it's just, it's, it's easy for me to keep going and it's easy to be motivated. And frankly, like all of you who, as I was going through these attacks were sending me like DMs, you didn't even know me, I don't know you, um, and saying how important it was the work and to see that I've tried to stand up, not just for myself, but uh, other marginalized journalists, other marginalized professors, um, that has just, um, it's, get, it's heartened me and it's, it's helped me uh, in my darker days. So again, grateful that everyone is even sitting up in this room listening to me right now. And, and truly, um, I hope that I will continue to be uh, a door opener for others coming behind me and that you will continue to support the work. Nicole Hannah-Jones, thank you so much. Thank you very much Hello. for your work and your time. <laughs>